let me just uh, lay out how I'm going to spend my next eight, nine minutes um, talking about what techno-nationalism means in, for the semiconductor sector, but more broadly in uh, US-China relations, trade relations, as well as uh, the global commercial business landscape in general. Um, I would, I would say that the way I've defined techno-nationalism is it's essentially the linkage between uh, a country's level of innovation and its enterprises and how those bolster national security, economic strength. But I would add, I would add, and this is very important, and this is a key issue going forward for China, the U.S., and China versus the West, uh, ideology. Uh, ideology is manifest in technology, or I would put it another way. The way technology is used, i.e. for things like censorship, surveillance, monitoring, et cetera, um, is now going to become a major factor when we talk about export controls and, and restricted entity lists, et cetera, for the use of American and Western technology by Chinese companies. So those would be the three things. Now, I would say that Huawei, and I'm sure everybody's very familiar with Huawei, um, represents the perfect microcosm of this US-China techno-nationalist issue. It's the perfect microcosm because all of those three areas that I've just mentioned are manifest in, uh, in the, the business footprint and the geopolitical footprint uh, of, of Huawei. And if you, for those of you who may be familiar with this, there was this so-called Section 301 report under the, uh, the, the, the Trade Act of 1974, which listed, not very well quantitatively, but listed uh, the key areas that were the most problematic when dealing with the, the state-centric uh, sort of state capitalist system of China and its systemic differences with the US and the West, which have now become um, a real problem now that China is you know, 18, 19%, pushing 20% of global GDP. Uh, and those were forced technology transfer, essentially, um, sort of vague, very, uh, very somewhat pernicious uh, licensing laws that allowed for local companies to be able to make very, very small adjustments to Western technology and thereby claim that as their own technology. Um, the, 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 the portion that I think is gonna be the most significant going forward, and this is where we're gonna see a shift of attention is going to be the economic subsidies and the economic support that companies like Huawei have been getting. Um, and I, I think we're going to see a, a range of, of, of countermeasures uh, put out by the U.S., um, which, will, which will go beyond export controls uh, and so on. And then, of course, the last area that, that Huawei has been accused of is, and this is the one that we're hearing the most of, uh, about, um, and this is uh, cybersecurity. Uh, that's is somehow, you know, if, if, if Huawei 5G uh, systems are uh, and infrastructure is, is built, that somehow the Chinese Communist Party uh, will be able to access uh, data and will be able to spy. There's been no evidence that this is true, at least publicly, but I think that's going to be a moot point anyway, because I think we're going to come back to the economic side of things uh, much more so uh, when we start looking at economic techno-nationalism. So this brings us to, uh, to semiconductors and why semiconductors have become so important uh, in this, in this so-called uh, techno-nationalist you know, jousting contest that we have going on. And, there, and it's very, very simple. Um, a semiconductor is the single most important technology for any industry of the future for any emerging and foundational industry uh, and anything that's, you know, anything that's going to be important in furthering both hard and soft power uh, for any country uh, is going to be driven first and foremost by semiconductors. Um, as Chris mentioned, um, I've, I've done a comprehensive report on this. Please take a look at that. Also have a report coming out tomorrow on decoupling, strategic decoupling in the tech sector with China. Um, so, if you look at China's made in, you know, the Made in China 2025 plan, there are 10 key industries that they have targeted. Semiconductors are number one, and then you've got, you know, autonomous vehicles, robotics, and, and, and others. Not one of those industries can advance without semiconductors. So what we have, 
what we have playing out now is we have a, a, a situation where we have US companies which are dominant in the semiconductor field. They're way ahead. Uh, as Yukon mentioned, they have a huge market in China, but the flip side to that is China is way, way behind when it comes to semiconductors. They simply don't have the capabilities to make leading edge uh, chips and semiconductors. So, you know, some people would say that this Made in Ch uh, China 2025 plan is not really a plan to dominate, but it's, a, it's an act of desperation to try and catch up. Uh, I think in many areas, uh, at least based on my analysis, I think the level of sophistication uh, of Chinese technology sectors is might be a little bit overstated. But at the end of the day, the Achilles heel uh, for any kind of Chinese advancement or development is semiconductors. And it's a big, big problem for China. So from a techno-nationalist perspective, the US uh, has seized upon this and they have essentially weaponized uh, uh, technology supply chains around semiconductors they have, um, of course, put Huawei and a number of other critical Chinese companies on restricted entity lists, meaning that they cannot access this technology without special permission, or in some cases, they can't get it at all. So um, a couple of things I'll highlight. And again, Huawei is at the center of this. Um, the first is that, um, let's be honest. I mean, Yukon mentioned ZTE. ZTE was in deep, deep trouble uh, because of the degree of, of American technology that went into their phones. Um, there was a, a proposed seven-year ban, and it was, it was Google and Intel and all the American companies, which represented a little, about 35% of the value in one of those phones. They went back and lobbied the government and said, hey, you can't do this. The collateral damage is going to be really bad. It's going to hurt all of us. Uh, but I think with Huawei, it's going to be different. There's no question that the U.S. semiconductor industry is highly exposed. That if they're, you know, if they're blocked out and cut out of the uh, of the market based on uh, U.S. Uh, sanctions and controls, they're going to lose market share. There's no question about that. The Chinese are going to double down on their efforts to de-Americanize their supply chains. There's no question about that. Um, but. What's interesting about that is this is this is a little bit different. You know, we, you, you throw in the COVID-19 pandemic and how that exposed uh, an over-reliance on Chinese supply chains to begin with in, in key strategic industries. And you look at what the U.S. has just done uh, to, to, to block TSMC from uh, producing chips for high silicon, which is a subsidiary of Huawei. And it is an absolute, um, a potential death blow. I mean, it is... If, if high silicon cannot obtain its five nanometer chips for its, uh, for its uh, 5G infrastructure uh, and even for uh, smartphones, that is gonna be a major, major blow and possibly an existential threat to, to Huawei. So what we've seen now is in, in the last three weeks or so, um, we had the US changing the foreign direct product rule, which now says, that even for foreign made products uh, of any kind, if they've got US technology in them, uh, you cannot sell that product, period, to, uh, to a restricted entity. So for, for Huawei, this was a big blow because TSMC, which is the world's largest uh, subcontractor, uh, it's foundry, it, in other words, it makes chips. Most of its clients are American, by the way. Um, th they're the supplier. And so they use American manufacturing equipment. Uh, American companies control almost 60% of the, of the market there. And they use design uh, and uh, designs and software where American companies control about 90% of the market. So it's a chokehold. It's an absolute chokehold. So the question is what happens? Where do we go from here? Um, well, we're already seeing that we're in a period now of strategic decoupling. It doesn't mean that the entire uh, trade relationship between China and the US is gonna decouple. What it does mean is there will be specific, strategic, sensitive industries, all of which are gonna be on the dual use list, meaning that it's technology that doubles as both commercial and military technology, which is, a, which is pretty much everything today, you know, cutting edge technologies. There are going to be very key specific um, um, decouplings there. One, because the Chinese have to do it 
because they, they can't remain exposed and vulnerable to the whims of, uh, you know, U.S. politicians and, you know, uh, get, get cut off at a, at a critical time. So they will double down on their efforts and they will speed up their efforts to try and develop things themselves or to go somewhere else outside of the U.S. to get their technology. Um, so that's going to happen. We will see reshoring of key strategic industries, and we've seen that with TSMC. The United States um, got uh, TSMC to uh, agree to build a state-of-the-art uh, fab in Arizona, which will produce exclusively for American customers, uh, including the U.S. military, uh, because there were fears that as uh, the relationship between TSMC and Huawei and other Chinese companies in, uh, increase that there would be potential espionage, sabotage of chips made in Taiwan. Um, so they are moving. So this is an example of how not only in the semiconductor industry, but in strategic industries, we will see some diversification, uh, meaning, uh, you know, again, moving ring fencing and, um, and, and, and producing, creating new ecosystems for strategic and economic purposes. Um, so uh, the other thing is, is um, more broadly, the world, you know, global value chains have been fragmenting anyway because of automation, because of, uh, uh, you know, national data laws. And, and so we've, we've seen a fragmenting of global value chains even before this trade war and even before uh, COVID-19. So now this is all accelerating. And finally, I would just say that, there, there will always be an in China for China strategy because it's going to be such a key market. So if you're a big company and the Chinese market is important to you, you're gonna to have to spend the money and make the efforts to ring fence your in China operations, right? And we see this happening while at the same time, the world is fragmenting into regionalized and localized value chains and you're gonna to have to start building, um, you know, particularly if there are strategic issues around this. So the semiconductor industry, um, finally, I'll close with this. Um, it's absolutely key. There's no question about it. Um, but there's a China conundrum, what I'll call the China conundrum for all of these, these, these companies, semiconductor companies and other tech companies. The end game in Chinese industrial policy is to supplant these companies and to have Chinese companies make these products. That is the end game, that is the plan. So, at what, so the game has been for American companies, as long as they have a technological and foreign companies, as long as they have an edge, they can sell and make and produce and play in, in the Chinese sandbox, uh, but try to keep uh, you know, one or two generations ahead. But let's assume that at some point, uh, Chinese industry catches up. Um, what happens? to Intel, what happens to NVIDIA, and what happens to Micron and Broadcom and all these companies? They've got competitors, right? They've got competitors in China and potentially they've got competitors overseas. So this is gonna take me right back to the Huawei microcosm. This is why the US government is trying to crush Huawei, okay? Uh, and so the world is, is you know, there, yes, there's gonna be collateral damage, no question about it, there's going to be uh, there's going to be real problems with collaboration, and uh, and there's going to be redundancies. We're going to lose economies of scale in a lot of these industries. We won't have hyper rationalized value chains because of these things. So, at the heart of that will be semiconductors.